Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Virgin most powerful, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 There are some distinctions about demons which I think would be good to make so that people actually have kind of a context or an understanding of certain things. The first I mentioned last night, which is generational spirits, and basically what a generational spirit is, it's a, it's a, it's a demon that's passed from parents to children normally. But it can also be passed like of a particular individual within the home, um, and usually it's not with possession. With possession, demons are not passed normally. It's with obsessions. So in cases of obsessions, if the parents do something, um, or if the parents have an obsession, very often it can be passed from child. Some of that's partly learned behavior, but some of it is also that, that uh, with the demon being in the home, um, particularly on the side of the father, if the father doesn't do his part to protect the family, um, it can open up the doors so that the other people within the family become affected that is passed from generation to generation. Normally, <clears throat> it comes from somebody doing something simple within the family, and then that opens the door if the demon gets in and it gets passed from generation to generation. Um, some of them are fairly serious. Some of them are somewhat benign. Like I, I knew one guy, who, and sometimes they're passed unbeknownst. The person may not know the fact, and it may not be done. Um, the person who's passing it may have received it from a prior generation. They may not know about it. They pass it without knowing it. I know the case of a guy who passed it to his daughter um, uh, without knowing about it. Um, and then she passed it. Well, actually, the way we discovered there was a generational spirit it didn't surface until it got to um, her, her child who was baptized in the new rite without the exorcisms. So, uh, and that kid was, I mean, he was only like eight or nine years old that would try to gouge her eyes out and everything else. And he was, or it was only eight or nine months old and was trying to gouge her eyes out and stuff. So he was like, and he didn't even have this look on like things demonic. So, but um, uh, after two exorcisms of it, it's pretty much just normal now. But the point is, is that it's, um, if there's things that can be passed, uh, as, but some of them can be very serious. I know a family that has a generational spirit of rape. Every woman for the last five generations that family has been raped. Uh, so we've, but we've tried to block it. Fortunately, so far, the daughter hasn't been so far, so we're trying to keep that from happening. So, so this is serious, serious business, you know. Um, so there's generational spirits. There's also what they call familiar spirits. Those are ones that are... Um, to a particular individual. It's very often a sign, just as we're assigning a guardian angel. Satan will sign a guardian demon to tempt the person to pay attention to the individual, that type of thing. Then there's also familiar. A familiar, that's a, the, uh, the familiar, that's a far, sorry, the familiar is the one that's particular to the individual. Familial is the one that's assigned with family. So sometimes you'll have a family that just has kind of a disorder in it, and it's uh, very often you'll find if you just exercise the family that'll get all cleaned up and the family's very normal underneath it all. But there's different kinds of demons too. There's ministering spirits. Those are the ones that serve people in particular ways. There's all sorts of different categories. Uh, very often if a priest can find out what the kind of one you're dealing with, um, it's helpful especially if it's a generational one because generational ones generally are easy, very easy to break generally. Okay, so means of warning off demons. Well, of the six diabolic, uh, the six extraordinary diabolic activity, there's different remedies for each of the ones. Now, the ones that are external pain, which I mentioned is the first, the remedy is prayer on the side of the individual who's being afflicted. So that's the principal way. And other people can pray. Um, but usually God doesn't allow that kind of thing unless there's uh, some purification of the individual that he wants to occur. For diabolic um, possession, the principal meaning of liberation is exorcism normally major or solemn. So there's, there's a distinction between what they call a private and a solemn exorcism. A private exorcism is what any priest can do without faculties from the bishop. Um, and they include everything from, um, there's a part of the ritual that he can say, down to what they call prayers of deliverance or liberation prayers. So this can be um, said in order to break um, these particular things. If it's not too severe, even the person himself who's possessed can actually break it if it's not too severe. That's also the case with diabolic obsession and even um, uh, 
even with forms of upset of infestation and obsession, those two, those can also be broken sometimes by the individual, depending on the circumstances. I know a pretty good woman who um, was prayed over, became diabolically possessed. Fortunately, over the course of about 20 years, she just said certain prayers, she just kept working on it, eventually, it just eventually broke it. But normally, or often that doesn't happen, the individual is in such a state of prostration, they can't really do anything to help themselves, or the type of possession is so strong that they can't do anything. And possession is by degree. And there's different kinds. Um, and so you have to, that's one of the things the priest has to kind of find out is the degree of the possession. Usually the degree of the possession is proportionate to the type of demon you're dealing with, normally. Some, there's different kinds of possession. Some are very violent. Some are very, very quiet. The demons don't do anything. There's, or they may not even say anything. They may be mute spirits. There's some that won't shut up. You know, you say, whoa, whoa, and it's, it's always to distract. Um, they have all sorts of different kinds of personalities. So you get a hold of one that's constantly cracking jokes, and unless you have some serious discipline, they're pretty good at it. Um, and so and it's all a distraction. It's all a, the, the goal is to drag it out. Now, why do they want to drag it out? Well, basically, it comes down to this. The beating you have to give them has to exceed or be worse than what's in hell. That's what basically what it boils down to. So, <clears throat> um, what they'll do is they'll constantly try to distract you to drag it out. Why do they drag it out? Well, the reason being is because, remember, this pain of loss that they suffer. It's not as bad for them uh, suffering that pain as law of loss when they have the distraction of possessing somebody or influencing somebody because that gives them a bit of a distraction, gives them a bit of delight, and so it mitigates their suffering. And so the last thing they want to do is go back to hell because then, the, then they're back into their complete loneliness which they had before. Even though they're making the person's life miserable, they would prefer to do that, to have the company of making their life, making their life miserable than actually being in hell alone. Uh, the other thing is, too, is as soon as they're, it's broken, then the ridicule in hell they have to face. Now, if they manage to get the person to commit suicide, they get praise in hell. But if they don't, if they're booted out, or if they lose the possession, then they get ridiculed by the other demons in the process. And so that's one of the reasons they don't want to do it. You can have more than one demon possessing an individual. Um, there can literally be thousands. Um, usually, as I mentioned, there's usually one to five, or seven maybe. Um, and there's always a head demon. And he always puts the lowest demon in the front for fodder, except initially. Initially, he wants to be in the driver's seat. But as soon as the exorcist starts to stuff, he puts the little one out the front and lets him take the beating. So, um, and if you beat up on him long enough, usually he'll cough up the information about who the head demon is. So, um, only because of the fact that the ridicule and the beating up he'll take from the head demon is as bad as what you're meeting out on him. So he'll eventually cough up the information. So that's normally with diabolic possession, that's the normal way it's broken, is through exorcism on the side of the priest, normally it's solemn. As soon as I find out someone is possessed, then that, that I'll usually, I'll continue doing private exorcisms to give the person who's afflicted some relief, but then I immediately I'll seek faculties. For obsession cases, I never seek faculties because it can usually be broken on its own without any particular difficulties. Diabolic obsession. Um, oh, and when a person is possessed, there's all sorts of things that you have to put them on a regimen of prayer and that type of thing because and you have certain things you have to find out about their life to make sure they're not doing anything to, um, to cause the possession or cause its continuance. Um, very often people have to give up. I have, um, uh, there's a vast majority of the people possessed who come to be liberated come to a juncture. They come to a point where they're told, okay, this is what they're holding on to to find out what the cause is. This is an attachment you have, not always, not in all cases. There are some that are possessed through no attachment on their own. God just allows the demon to remain there until the specific things in their life is worked out. But in many cases, it's because a person's holding on a particular sinful kind of behavior or a particular thing that's disordered. And so they'll get to a certain point and they'll say, you have to give this up. A vast majority do not. They leave. They do not continue. Uh, my vast majority, I would say, one in three stay and go through the regimen. Even though living with these things is a complete nightmare, giving they, the demons are very good at getting them to be fearful of giving up this thing so that they can hold on to them. Possession is, uh, can be broken in two different ways based upon the nature of it as well. 
demons normally affix themselves to something in an appetitive faculty. By appetitive, it's that either in the, in the uh, it's usually in some emotional thing that the person's holding on to. Usually, not always. Again, some of them are not. But they can also possess the person based on a simple intellectual error. And so what can happen is, is once you find out that intellectual error is, once the person sees the truth of the situation, the thing which the demon is holding on to gets broken and then the possession is broken. Those are in some cases. This is why in some rare cases people who are possessed can actually go to a psychologist and get straightened out just because he can say, well, wait a minute, that's not the way this works. It works this way, and then boom, it'll break the possession. Or sometimes people just want to acknowledge it and it'll break it. But those aren't that common. Usually it takes something above and beyond that, but you have to kind of fair it out. One of the things you have to do is you have to find out where their intellectual error lies and if the possession is connected to that error. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, because you can have process or possessed or not. It's not because of their error religiously. Um, diabolic obsession, the principal ways in which that is um, overcome is through exorcisms. Not only private, but if a priest has general faculties, there's two kinds of faculties which a priest gets. There's the faculties, uh, odd persona. That's a lot of which means to the particular individual, particular case. Um, and then there's general faculties, where they're given um, faculties to anybody who comes to them, they can have the jurisdiction of the church to drive them out. Um, that's uh, it's nice, but when, as soon as the priest gets general faculties, it becomes his full-time job. I only do this part-time, and in the last two weeks I've done over 50. So if that gives you any idea. In the last... I've, started, I've been doing this for four years, and the last two years alone I've done somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500. If that gives you any idea of the, the immensity of the problem. But, and I only do it part-time, I don't like getting, I don't, I don't have time for general faculties, I just don't have time unless I was released from my other obligations. The um, demons know the difference between faculties, and the priest has faculties, and when he does it, there was one individual who came to me who had at least 13, I beat the names of 13 demons out of him, by the time I got to uh, realize, okay, this guy, we need to get faculties. So when I <clears throat> um, wrote the bishop to get faculties, um, before, right, actually, the re- thing that precipitated me realizing, okay, i got to get faculties, was um, there came a certain point where the head demon just got sick of me. And uh, he was kind of taking it for a little while, and finally he, he you know, he was doing these deceptive things and finally he got sick of it and he just says, where's your authority? And that, that's, a cue, that's a cue to say, you're not getting ready unless you get faculties. So then I just stopped everything and I said, okay, I think we'll get faculties. They know the difference. Now this is an important point for some of those who are in the traditional movement as to why say the Kantism is utterly flawed. Because they'll very often say, oh, well, you know, these bishops were consecrated in this new uh, rite, and they don't have jurisdiction, or they're heretics, and so they don't, they don't possess the office, and so they don't have jurisdiction, etc. That's utterly false, because the fact is, is that I've received faculties from a bishop who is a heretic, and the fact of the matter is, is that they know, the demons know when you got it and when you don't. It's the same thing also with the Eucharist, that very often you'll say, here, St. Nicodemus, say that the the change in the, um, for all invalidates the mass. Well, first of all, that's utterly historically, theologically unsupportable. But the other problem is, is that even though they try and do it by various crafty means, but the other thing is too is that demons do not make distinctions between hosts that are consecrated in the new rite and consecrated in the old. They react the exact same way to both. So it's not you know this is the new rite Jesus. It's just Jesus. That's it. So that's something which uh, you know when they come and argue with me, I'm just like, like I don't have time for you. The fact of the matter is, this is the reality with which I deal with day in and day out, and they know the difference. And if you can't know the difference, I'm sorry, then you just go and pray and hope for God will give you the grace to get it straightened out. By the way, do you want exercise? No, just All right. Continuing <laughs> with obsession, though, is, is not only exorcism, private, and deliverance prayers. There's other prayers a priest, a priest can do to say um, in order to break it. There's what, um, with people who are obsessed, anybody who's possessed or obsessed, um, or even suffers from oppression, I put them on a thing called the uh, Auxilian Christian Norm. That's a group that was started by two exorcists. It's had absolutely phenomenal success. I tell people, I tell people, don't become part of this group unless you're serious about your spiritual life. Because um, very often people take a bit of a beating in the initial part. It takes about a month for them to get stripped of certain things, and then there's, there's a deepening in the spiritual life. So unless people are really serious, they don't become a group, but part of the group. But there is, um, sometimes when people become affected by, once they start saying the prayers, they enjoy the protection because it has ecclesiastical approval, 
they, they enjoy the protection of the church, and they also enjoy the protection for their families. But there are two reasons why the exorcists start. First is because they need people praying for them. Now, most exorcists get the charismatic renewal involved. As I mentioned last night, that's more of a problem than it solves. The second problem is, is that... Um, is that they have noticed that you'll have families that raise their kids perfectly, they have a decent prayer life, they're going to mass regularly, and they're teaching the kids the proper catechism and things of that sort, and all of a sudden, for no reason whatsoever, kid gets about 17 and they go off in la-la land, for no reason whatsoever. And so we, that was started in order to provide protection for families that, so that if they had that problem or protect their kids from uh, being influenced, so that type of thing wouldn't happen. Um, it's had absolutely phenomenal success. I'll, I'll give you a couple of um, examples to give you an idea of it. There was a, uh, a friend of mine who um, he had a house that was possessed. This is the one I mentioned. It took a year to get this thing out. After I got that one out, the, the witches in the neighborhood found out about it and sent him another one. Well, he wasn't very big dude, so we booted him out in one session. And so I put him on those prayers. I said, look, you've got to start saying this to provide good protection for your family. The night he started saying those prayers, the witch who lived next door to him packed up and fled. Within three months, he cleared out a two-block radius of the witches in his neighborhood. Because in the area which he lived, there's a high percentage of witches. It's one of those things that um, most people don't know, is that Lincoln, Nebraska has one of the highest, this is where it occurred, has one of the highest percentages of witches in the country, if not the highest. So it's even worse than Salem. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, is that it's, uh, it, so he, was, he, he cleared them out. There was a case of a, um, of a girl who was possessed, and I put the parents on, I said, here, you have to start saying these prayers. It's the night they started saying those prayers, the child screamed uncontrollably for three straight days. So it has a tremendous impact. There's one other story, and this will give you kind of hope so that you become a member and pray. Um, there was a woman who had a husband who, for 40 years, she prayed that he would take his spiritual life more seriously. He just wouldn't do it. He went to Mass. I don't even know if he went to confession, but he went to Mass on, on Sundays, but he wouldn't pray and do much more than that. So she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and got nowhere. She started saying the prayers. Two weeks later, he came up to her and said, I need to start saying my prayer. I need to start being more serious about my spiritual life. So the point is it actually provides protection for the people in the family. And it can actually break certain kinds of obsessions because this was an obsession that he had. Because the demons can block people. It's not just that they're constantly thinking about doorknobs. Oh my god, I can't get that next doorknob. It's not that. Although you get those kinds of things from time to time. But it's very often it's just a blockage. Or there's an emotional block. Or there's some type of psychological block. It's something that's very important that you actually use um, to recognize that very often people won't convert because there's a, a demonic blockage of some sort so you can remove it. There was a time when I was um, talking with um, this gentleman who was. Um, He'd come to the Latin Mass, and he uh, he just did, couldn't he couldn't believe in God. And I was sitting with another exorcist. We were just talking to him, and he, the other exorcist was giving him the rational proof for God's existence, and she actually knew God through the natural line of reason. And he, he would the guy would follow him all the way until he got to the conclusion, and therefore, this is God. God exists, right? And he would always backtrack. No, oh, no, you can't know that. You can't know that. You can't know that. So, uh, being a philosopher, that was the wrong thing to say. So I said, What do you, what do you mean by the word no? So he looks at me, he's completely jarred, right? And I did that because I knew that once he was distracted, we'd give the exorcist the other time to say a binding prayer, which is another prayer I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And as soon as he finished it, the guy turned over to, I mean, he didn't even respond to me. And he turns back to him and he just says, maybe you can, maybe you can prove exists. So the, the point being is that there can be blockages to people. And if you have blockages in your family, uh, this is something that can be very useful. Um, there are some copies of the I'm doing Christian Worm over here. There's only about 35 copies, so you know if you have, a, don't take 15 for your family. You know, try and leave them for the people that uh, take one for family. And if not, you can go to they have a, um, a website at doingchristian.org. It's on the internet. So you can get there. There's also some. Prayers to the Please repeat that. Yeah, on Zoom and Christian. Well, actually, the better thing to do would actually just come over here after the conference and write it down because it's all actually on the on the prayers. It's, uh, the website's listed on the front of the prayers. Okay. Um, then there's what's called a binding prayer. Now, basically, what a binding prayer is is it's a prayer that's said uh, that's done in order to bind the demon from performing a certain kind of behavior. And so, if you look at the binding prayer, it says "Spirit of," and then there's an "M," which you mean is the name of the thing. So let's say, for example, that you have a kid that's just constantly back talking to you. He doesn't know what you do. You know, you even spank him because it just doesn't work. Nothing you do works, right? Well, then what you can do is just say, "Spirit back talking." 
I bind you in the name of Jesus, and he goes on again, and I command you to leave in the name of the child, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? You can say that prayer, and very often what people will find with this binding prayer, and you can also use it for your own temptation, so if people have chronically suffered from a temptation all their life that they fought against and they just didn't seem to get anywhere, as soon as the temptation occurs, if you say that binding prayer, very often they'll notice, boom, it has this immediate effect. And it'll be that way for the, the first few times that you use it, and then the effect will slowly kind of wear off. And what that is, is the demons will kind of back up a bit, and then they'll just be back at you, and they'll just keep doing it. But the moral of the story is, as I always tell everybody, I like that sign that you see sometimes in businesses, that, you know, beatings will continue until morale improves. Right? <laughs> and that's what you do. You just keep beating up, and you just keep using it, and over the course of time, it'll wear them down, and they'll eventually let loose of it. Okay, so a binding prayer is very effective. Um, I use it all. I use it all the time. Um, with diabolical obsession, because it's principally a matter of taking control of your thought, one of the principal means of keeping it at bay, like if a person's really suffering from um, common ones, which you see today, are depression or anger or um, melancholy, things of that sort. One of the things that can get it to lift, and this is one of the clearest signs that a person's actually obsessed is if they sit down and pray, not vocal prayer, but meditation, for about five to ten minutes, if it starts to lift, that's a sign that it's actually diabolic obsession. And then if they kind of stop and it starts creeping back, that's usually a sign. If it's psychologically based, it won't really have much of an effect, usually. It'll still kind of feel depressed even after they're done praying. Whereas this will cause it to lift. So I very often tell people if you, you know, if you get those moments where you start feeling coming on, go and do some meditation for a while, specifically meditation. Um, okay. The, so those are the, some of the things that you can do about obsession. If you can find a priest that can do um, chapter 3, that's the same uh, prayer which um, Leo Thirteenth wrote. If you can get him to do that, oh, Leo, really, it's, very, it's very helpful. The patterns are very different, too, with the different kinds of demonic activity. With possession, you get this all the time. It's like a heartbeat. It's just constantly dipping. And there's times where it goes bad for long periods of time, and it's been good for a long period of time. You kind of get these dips. It's just there's, it's a very consistent pattern, right? Whereas with obsession, that's when you're doing exorcism. You get these patterns. It's the patterns are pretty much the same. Um, and the symptoms, the, the, the other kinds of symptoms will become ameliorated to a certain degree, but you still get these, the same kind of a pattern. Whereas with obsession, it's a very different thing. As I mentioned last night, it's kind of a slow panning out. Eventually, then a few couple of dips, and then usually they're clear sailing. And that's one of the ways that you can distinguish between possession and obsession. With possession, there is almost always obsession. Because they obsess the individual to get him to do bad things, or to do disordered things in order to increase their control over him. Okay. Um, and then there's the um, diabolic oppression. And with diabolic oppression, it's an external thing. God allows it for the person to increase their spiritual life. So the principal way that diabolic obsession is done away with is an increase in prayer. That's the way it's God allows it for the person to be afflicted so that they'll actually pray more. And usually if the people to be Catholic, that's just the, like the grace will kind of just naturally do that, and that's what they should do. There is a, a, a practice or a regimen of good people on when they start suffering from diabolical oppression. And very often when people are possessed or, or obsessed, there's also the oppression. But when people have oppression, they don't, if they did, it was very common to have oppression without the obsession or the possession. But sometimes they'll demonically oppress the individual to drive them to despair, and then from that they can enter the door and become obsessed. So the goal is ultimately to take possession of you, but it's an incremental thing. And you'll see that sometimes with some people. Sometimes the possession just comes, uh, an obsession, an oppression comes out of the blue, boom. Like if someone's performed witchcraft or some superstitious practice. Whereas sometimes you'll see people who will suffer from diabolical oppression, and it's just kind of a gradual thing they're trying to take over the individual's life. But there's one particular thing that I have found extremely beneficial in relationship to diabolic oppression, and that's the divine chaplet, the chaplet of divine mercy. If they say that every single day to drive back the demons of oppression for that specific intention, what it will do is it has a convincing design, it has a different pattern. With oppression, it's a slow, gradual tapering off of the effects. Eventually, boom, it'll cease. So, um, 
they, you know, people will, it's, it usually they don't notice it for a while until they look back and they'll say, you know, hey, my job's going better, or, you know, my wife and I are getting a lot better, or things of that sort. So it's just a slow, gradual thing. It's extremely effective. It's extremely effective. I've never had a case where people didn't do that consistently, but it didn't eventually break it. Um, the next is diabolic infestation that can really only be straightened out through exorcism. Now, if, unless it's a really slight case, people can sprinkle holy water around it with less salt and take holy oil and make signs of the cross on various items throughout the house. That can be very helpful, and it can sometimes weaken them. Um, sometimes it stirs things up, which is just a sign that, okay, you've got to get a priest in. Diabolic subjugation or dependence. People who voluntarily submit to replace themselves under Satan, they first have to reject the, the pact which they made with Satan that has to be done and then there's a curse that a person persists in order to um, seal it that is to break the actual pact um, and then sometimes exorcism if necessary it depends if the person has become possessed or not okay so those are the general remedies I want to talk a little bit about some specific things which lay people can use to protect themselves their family and that type of thing the first, again, is prayer, particularly meditation. If people are meditating every single day, regularly, it's highly unlikely they're going to become obsessed. It's just unlikely, or even possessed. So if they're, if they're praying meditation every day. And if you want to get a good book that will actually explain meditation, there's one put out by Tan called The Ways of Mental Prayer by a gentleman named Lahody, L-E-H-O-D-Y. It's the best book I've been able to find. It's the most thorough in that sense. Um, some of the other books are a little bit more pious and they actually help people on that level. It depends on the particular individual. But this will give you the mechanics, the do's, the don'ts, how it's done, and, that type, and the necessity for doing it, um, which is actually one of the biggest problems. You know, prayer is an action, it's an act to the subvirtue of religion, which is a subvirtue, it's a subvirtue because religion is a subvirtue to justice. Which means that you have an obligation in justice to render God his due. Now, part of this is that you have an obligation to worship God every day for at least 15 minutes as a layman. That's the general consensus of theologians. That's one of the reasons why St. Augustine said, if you don't pray, you will not go to heaven. He says, if you don't pray, you'll go to hell. And the reason being is because you're systematically violating justice. God has a right to do worship unless you're doing it at least 15 minutes a day. Then, and you should try and be doing meditation, which is the, the higher form of prayer. There's nine levels of prayer meditation. It's the second, the lowest is vocal prayer. It's good, but it's not It's not as good as meditation. And there's a prayer of, uh, the effect of prayer of simplicity, but it's contemplation it goes up to the ladder. But as Teresa of Avila says, the, the step to the hot, to the even transforming union, which is the highest level, the entrance is always through meditation. And that's what most people don't do. Meditation collapsed after the Second Vatican Council, not because of the Council, but because I'm convinced, at least, because of the change in the right of Mass. When the whole Mass is this, then what happens is, and not that it's not that the new Mass is bad, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that when you habituate people to the prayer is always vocal, well, the minute the prayer stops, we think that the vocal stuff stops, they think, oh, they don't have to pray. So that's collapsed, giving things, giving after marriage has collapsed, and that's one of the reasons why people are very often susceptible to demonic influence. Fasting, and this means uh, perfect, I think people should be fasting somewhat regularly. One of the new problems with the legislation in the church, and this is something which I, I think I mentioned here even in a homily, like one of the problems with the new legislation in the church, again, I think what they've legislated is bad, but that it's not enough. It's good, but it's not enough. St. Thomas says that fasting is a virtue. The natural law commands all the virtues. It means that God commands us through the natural law that we are to pursue all the virtues that we are capable of according to our state in life. That means a diabetic may not be able to fast, or he can only fast a little bit, but people who can normally fast have an obligation to fast. Why? Because they have an obligation to do, as St. Paul says, bring my body into perfection. <coughs> Most people don't bother with that. Now, because people don't fast, it, 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 because it's a virtue, that means it's a good habit. A habit is developed by habitually, habitually doing it. Now, this means that, this basically means this. It means in the old dispensation, the old law, you had to fast the entire length, six straight weeks. It takes three weeks to corrupt a habit and three weeks to develop a habit. That's roughly, for three weeks and three weeks, that's about six weeks, about the length of length. 
And that's very wise on the side of the church. But then the church did something else. It had specific days throughout the course of the year that you had to fast, like on the vigil of major feasts, on amber days, and things of that sort, so that people would actually have the habit of fasting. This is why Lent for people in the past wasn't as bad as when people think of, maybe they fasted the whole of that. Yeah, they did. Because they were in the habit of it. It's actually easier. And like any other habit, as you do it, it's easier, and it actually becomes delightful to do. Not that the hunger pains are delightful, but the, the, the actual um, the actual ability to actually do it is uh, becomes delightful. The actual act of the virtue itself. Our Lord said, "This kind of demon can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. Prayer isn't enough. People pray for years and years and years and years and years. They don't get anywhere, and then they wonder why nothing's happening. Well, because you know, I've been praying for years, and they just won't change. And then all you have to do is ask them, are you doing some type of mortification, penance, or fasting?" And then you get the blank look. But that's the, that's the, that's one component that is unfortunately very much missing for people's lives. And very often people just can't seem to get control over a particular vice, even if it's just a minor one, a venial sin. And you just tell them, well, look at why don't you start fasting for it? Because then the fasting will actually give the person a greater self-control over themselves. And so as a result, they'll actually, it really gives them a certain sense of self-discipline and a certain joy that actually comes in it. As an exorcist, you have to fast. Um, quite regularly because of the fact that well, there's two reasons. One is the demons know your weakness. And so what they'll do is, unless you're fasting to overcome your own weaknesses, then what they'll do, and if you don't fast, it means that you just haven't brought your body into subjection, which means they can just beat you around as an exorcist. And usually with the, the first year or two after a uh, priest becomes an exorcist, he goes through a living nightmare because of the fact that he's, he's getting beat around all the time because of the fact that he hasn't subjugated his body well enough. But there comes a certain point, usually very often when he gets a very harsh possession case where he either has to do the black fast, which is bread and water for three straight days, on and off. Or you have to do what I have to do. I have a woman who's possessed and I have to fast six days a week, otherwise she cannot survive. And I've been doing it for five straight months. And you have to get into that. It's possible. I never thought I would have been doing it. You're looking at a guy who lost 95 pounds. Not from that particular case, by the way. But this is something which... Um, People, you, it's just something that, it, and there is a significant difference when you fast and when you don't. On the days I don't fast, I have to step up the prayers because otherwise it's very difficult for her to function. So, prayer and fasting. The next are the binding prayers, which I mentioned. Um, you should get in the habit of memorizing it. Use it regularly, not just for yourself or for your spouse. If you see some, something that's annoying you about your spouse, well, say the binding prayer. Um, then there's a thing called self-exorcism. And our Lord gave us the example. Peter comes up to us and says, don't go to Jerusalem. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, not that Christ had to be exercised, because Satan had no possession or any kind of influence ultimately over him, except insofar as the temptations he allowed um, Satan to do, only because the, to set, us, it set an example and to undo the fall of Adam and Eve. The temptations that Christ were were to undo the, tem- the, um, the damage caused by the temptation that Adam and Eve gave him to. I don't want to go into all the theology because it's kind of extensive. But the point is, is that um, Christ gave us that example. So when you get temptations or you get these things coming on, you say, get behind me. A binding prayer is a form of self-exorcism. And people should be doing these kinds of things regularly um, in order to kind of keep their, uh, the demons at bay in relationship to this. And again, not every temptation is from Satan. Let's be clear about that. Some people want to blame, I mean, you get this, some people actually want to blame the demons so that they don't have to account for their own mess that they've made in their own interior life. It actually brings up to uh, an important point. Now, you mentioned last night, every time you see you basically place yourself under the domination of Satan to a certain degree, and not that these can become possessed as a result of it, but you do that. That every single attachment you have to anything created whatsoever can become a thing upon which they can take you for a ride. And the reason being is this. It's, it, let me give you an example. This is kind of, let me give you a, a, an analogy. You know how you take, the, you take the rag or the towel and you stick it in front of the dog's face and it bites onto it and you start dragging it around? <laughs> but that's exactly the way demons are with respect to our attachments. If you have some an undue attachment to, um, you know, the particular hobby you do, not that hobbies are bad, they're actually good things, they're part of the virtue of eutropalia, um, the virtue virtue of right recreation. But the the point is is that um, they can take that, if if you hold on to that, 
they can just drag you around it by it because they can just suggest things in relationship to it and you'll start doing it. So they can just drag you all over the map. And so what does this mean? Well, it means that you have to have perfect detachment from absolutely everything that is created, even your wife, your home, everything. Does it mean you become cold to your wife? It's quite the contrary. We're not Buddhists. We're not Zen Buddhists. We become detached for the sake of going into nothingness. It's just absurd. What it is is we become detached because then through the detachment from everything created, our heart, the room in our heart is freed up for God to take his full presence in there and we can love him with our whole mind and our whole heart. Anytime you have an attachment, you can't fulfill the precept of charity perfectly. And so what happens? Well, then as a person becomes more charitable, then as he becomes detached and he tries to form acts of charity, then what happens is then what flows from charity is benignity and kindness and benevolence. And so the person actually becomes warmer in the process, not colder. It also perfects marital love because it's based on a natural human love, which is a good thing, but it's not perfect. Only charity is perfect for human beings. And so as it transforms, it will take that natural human love, and even the romantic side of marriage, and transform it into an act of charity, which is quite important. Charity, charity itself, by developing the virtues, is one of the principal ways in which you can break demonic influence in your life. Virtue. Because what is virtue? Well, it's the opposite. It breaks attachment. Any kind of advice is usually rooted in some kind of an attachment. And so, if, you, if you're constantly building on virtue, um, doing the things, and one of the ways to do that is you, you, have to, you have to get into the habit of developing a virtue of what's called honesty. It does not translate into English as honesty. It's probably more accurately translated, although not exactly as integrity. But basically what it is, is the virtue, St. Thomas says, it's a sub-virtue, or it's, he says, it's, it's the manifestation of the virtue of modesty. But it's the virtue in which the person, in each and every single action he performs, and in every single circumstance, always looks to do the virtuous thing. Most people don't do that. Most people just ride along with their emotions. Which is, again, one of the reasons why the emotions, is, since the demons can move the emotions, this is why you don't follow your emotions all the time, because they can drag you around. Not that emotions are bad. By the contrary, God put them in us because they are, in fact, good. But I think I made that distinction between antecedent and consequent passion. It's not until we have perfect virtue that, that the antecedent passions aren't there. Well, if there's no antecedent emotion, then the demons can't use our emotions to beat us around. And so that's one of the reasons why you have to really get your emotional life under control. And how do you do that? It's called virtue. So virtue is one of the principal ways to break demonic influence. Then there's the receive, frequent reception of the sacraments, which is also recommended, especially daily mass. People who are possessed, they can get to daily mass, or at least daily holy communion. It has a profound effect on them. When someone's possessed, and the demons are manifesting, and you hold up the Eucharist to give them communion, they'll just absolutely go like bananas. They can hardly take it. Um, if you can possibly get to daily mass, frequent confession. Confession is one of the most powerful things to break demonic influence. And if people are suffering from obsessions, I'll very often tell them, you know, you should make a general confession. And then I have them over there. There's a short list. There I only have about it's four pages long. But I only have about five copies um, because I actually thought I'd be seeing more people right out having to look at this. But it's a list of um, compiled, it's not extensive, and there's a bit of repeat in it, but it's not extensive, it's not completely extensive, of all the different ways in which demons can inf- inf- affect people. And you'd be a bit surprised about how some of the, the, some of the behavior, usually when people go through the list, they see their own themselves in it. So it's something that's uh, it's important. But the point is, is that when people go to confession, it weakens the demons for several reasons. One is humility. As soon as someone is possessed or obsessed, one of the first things I can tell them is you have to start working on humility. Because once you break any pride, then you'll, you'll break their ability to influence you. The second thing, again, in, the, in confession, is the sacrament of humility. We have to humiliate ourselves and go admit what we've done is wrong. The other thing is, is that it's the sacramental graces helps us to get out or keep avoid the particular behavior, which means the sacramental graces will work against any type of demonic inclinations. So frequent confessions. In other words, you should be leading a truly Catholic life. Frequent sacraments, praying regularly, fasting, doing all those things. Devotional life, starting up all the devotions. I'll talk a little bit more about those later. 
But those are the things that you want to actually begin and start doing in order to make sure. If the person, the odds of somebody becoming possessed through, uh, or obsessed even, who's leading a normal, good, Catholic life and striving for holiness, the odds of them becoming influences is very rare. It happens on occasion. There was a case of a nun in Iowa who became possessed um, through no fault of her own, and during the possession they asked what the cause was, and they said there was a particular sin in the region which God wanted to be straightened out through the penance done at this exorcism. So um, that's one of the, the reasons why it, it can happen, but it's very, very rare that that happens. As I mentioned, I think last night, people can become possessed through no fault of their own because someone casts a spell on them or um, something happens to them, somebody does something which causes a possession. Same thing with obsessions. Uh, and in most cases, though, it's caused because of some sinful behavior, and that's one of the things that has to be stopped, so we get a good Catholic life. One of the, um, um, as I mentioned, abortion is one of the principal ways in which people would have become demonically influenced. The other thing is, too, is one of the ways that women really open themselves up to becoming demonically influenced, and I know this is going to be hard to take, but just bear with me. God established, I think I might have mentioned this last time I was here, I can't remember, I'm getting too old. And when you become an exorcist, you, your aging, your aging process drastically increases, it's much more rapid. I tell everybody I'm 44, 43, going on 55, but, um, but anyway, the, um, God established what's called the divine economy of authority. And basically what that is, is that God set up an authority structure in the natural law, in nature. So even the demons have to obey it. So very often what they'll do is, and that this means, for example, if the father of the household says binding prayers over the people that he, because of his authority, he actually has the capacity to ward the demons off. If he fails to, he can actually open the doors. Or if he does something simple, he's the one who most principally opens the door. Other people can too, the wife, um, next, and then the children, starting with the oldest on down. But the point being is that there's this economy, this divine economy of authority. Now, St. Thomas makes the observation, he says, that if a, if a person acts contrary to this, uh, the order of authority, he acts contrary to an order, he is deprived of the effects of that order. What does this mean? If a wife will not submit to her husband, she will be robbed of his protection spiritually and opens herself up to become influenced. This is one of the things that you see almost habitually as an exorcist. Today, particularly because of the feminist movement. And one of the principal ways that they can really, really overcome um, any possession or obsession is by developing that submission. Not that he gets to treat her like trash. It's quite the opposite. St. Paul says, love your wife. And when Adam and Eve were created, St. Thomas says, and actually it's based upon the fathers, that when he says women are in three states. There's the state pre-fall, and the state pre-fall he says women are in the state of subordination because if he was created and subject to Adam's judgment and to his rule, but it's a subordination because of the fact that Adam always looked out for her benefit and always looked out for her well-being. But then after the fall, when Eve stepped out from under that authority by saying, here, eat the apple, Adam, that she stepped, as she stepped out from that divine established structure where it's his place to leave, then she became... Uh, she was robbed of the effects of his protection to a certain degree. And then what happens is she enters St. Thomas's into a state of subjection, which means Adam no longer looks out for her well-being. That's why St. Paul says, love your wife. Why? Loving is love is defined as willing the good of another. So if you love your wife, you're always going to be looking out for her well-being. So love is the act on the side of the man. It's the remedy for um, the, his tendency to not govern her in a way that's best for her spiritually. Then St. Thomas says that in heaven, so in this life now, all women are in a state of subjection in some way or another. But then he says um, in the next life, women are neither in a state of subordination nor subjection because some women rule in heaven. So the issue is not whether you rule here, and this is where the feminist movement has completely lost there are far more women higher and probably in heaven than their husbands because of the fact that they were they subordinated themselves, they were far more virtuous than their husbands. 
So the fact of the matter is, it's not whether you get to tell your husband what to do in this life, it's whether you're going to get to tell him what to do in the next life. <laughs> okay. All right. So the point is, is that we have to follow that divinely established structure because if we don't, then we become subject, we become um, subject to demonic influence. And when the wife is not subordinate to her husband, she opens up the children, not just a bad example, so it's a psychological thing as well, but she opens up the children to becoming demonically influenced by demons of disobedience and subordination and that type of thing. So very often when you see the kid that's unruly, not always, because I have seen kids that are absolutely unruly, has absolutely nothing to do with the parents, the parents are leading the right in the order of lives. But a lot of times you look at the kid and the kid's just completely out of control. All you have to do is look at the wife and she's supportive. And the opposite also applies too. I've seen families where the wife did everything on her part. She tried to lead an absolutely flawless life, but he just treated her like complete, absolute trash. And the children would then treat her, their, wife, their mother like garbage, and they would also, um, they themselves were not very subordinate because they realized that even if you're subordinate, you don't have to be. And so the father actually introduced demons of insubordination in the family that way. Because, and this is something which is very important. You know, you can tell guys, you, sometimes you see this and you try to sort things out. Okay, why is God allowing this possession case to go on for a while? Why is this person obsessed? It's because he wants the situations to be worked out in families. Well, sometimes you just have to say to the husband, do you love your wife? And you always get this, oh yeah, because he doesn't want to look like an adult by saying, no, no, no. Um, so he says, yeah, I love her. And then you just, all you have to do is ask one question, and this will usually floor most men. Do your children know it? And that is something which you very often do not see. Because there is a tendency out of original sin in man to be inclined not to love their wives. And that is, uh, some, that's why St. Paul says you've got to love her. That's why he said that. All right. The next is sacramentals. And that's what we're going to talk about a number of those. Um, the first is the St. Benedict medal, different kinds of medals. Different kinds of medals will have different effects. So, for example, the miraculous medal will very often drive out demons which are holding on to places or people or things of that sort to prevent them from converting. Um, but the St. Benedict Medal is quite powerful. Now, there's a number of different ways that you can use St. Benedict Medals, um, such as putting it at the entrance of each door and window to your home. We don't know why, but exorcists know that demons actually enter through, they don't, they, well, technically speaking, they don't enter through anything. They just apply their intellect or will wherever they want to, and that's where it happens. But they very often talk about how demons will enter the home through the doors or through the windows. And so if you put them over the one over each of the windows, that'll actually help provide some protection. Um, also on things that behave strangely. There's a particular book which I print out for um, priests to do exorcisms, um, with some private exorcisms. And I'll tell you what, man, I'm trying to get that thing out of my printer when I'm printing it, it's just an absolute nightmare. And I didn't get the problem solved until I put a St. Benedict on them and taped it to the to the, uh, the printer. I've also heard priests say, oh yeah, I've taped it to the computer when it's acting strange, and all of a sudden, boom, it just stopped doing it. So, um, and some demons just have a real affection for electronic things. I think the reason they do is because they know that we like them, and we depend upon them, and so we're easily, our chain is easily named around by them. Um, you see that with people when a computer goes awry, most people go, oh, and they just get really angry and irritated very quickly. Um, part of that is the reason there was a philosopher who, his name was Vogel, and he made the observation that electronic things or technology bring us a certain pleasure in the use because they, we get to control them and they, they bring us something that we like, right? And he says as a result, most people should really be doing some type of, te- doing some type of thing to do penance in order to counteract the intemperance that can kind of come up in relationship to electronic gadgets. You see that with guys more than women where they're just like, you know, they just, they're glued to the thing. And that's a sign of intemperance, ultimately. Um, but anyway, you can tape it to computers. You can, people can also carry it. You can tell your children to carry it. Now, you don't tape it to the kid's forehead. <laughs> but, 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 you know, having the children carry it with them and that type of thing, especially like on a scapular, which we'll talk about in a little bit, those things are, are particularly useful. Um, you have them in your cars, you should have your cars blessed, etc. Um, for that. And then, um, so metals are also sacred images. 
um, enthronement of the Sacred Heart. You should have your um, home enthroned in the Sacred Heart. That's particularly powerful. And the American Heart, that's a particularly powerful way to provide protection for your home. Um, okay, so there's different kinds of metals and other kinds of physical sacraments. Then there's holy oil. Now, here we're not talking about the oil of the sick that's destined for use in the sacrament. It's an abuse on the side of priests to use the sacrament of the sick or extreme unction for people who are possessed. And it's abuse. Why? Because the church has always taught that you cannot use the sacrament of the sick unless there is grave illness or the potential of death and there's some illness accompanying it. Well, there, and so this is what happened in the, in, in the progression theologically, and this is why it's all very sloppy. First it was, okay, it's used for people who are greatly sick. Then it just became, they were doing it to anybody who was sick. So somebody had a hangnail that came up during Mass and got annoying. Then it's said, they just said, oh, we can use it for mental illness. Well, unless it's physiologically based, unless it's going to cause a person possible death in the future, you can't use it. Then it went to that, oh, well, we'll use it for, for people who are possession because it's very similar to mental illness. That was the theological progression. The problem is it can't be used unless there's some danger of death. And it has to be based in some illness. That being the case, and the death doesn't have to be proxy, it can be removed. That being the case, you can't be anointing people that are um, possessed unless there's some physiological um, illness attached with it. Um, then you can use it, and it will have its, its good effect. Otherwise, it's an abuse of the sacrament. But this holy oil, it's an actual ritual out of the old rite in which the oil is actually blessed and it's exercised and blessed. It may be used on things such as on people, so you can, um, I tell people very frequently, you know, take a little bit on your thumb and make, take the sign, make the sign of the cross over your children's forehead each night before you go to bed with it. Now, parents can actually bless their children just as they can curse them, they can also bless their children. It, it stems from the office as parent. And they, they can't, um, they can say, um, you know, God bless you, and things of that sort. They can't bless other people, you can only bless people that are under you in this divine economy of authority. So. Fathers can bless their wives and their children. Wives and women can bless their children. They cannot bless their husbands. The um, children cannot bless their parents in that manner. But they can say, may God bless you by invoking, asking God, please bless my parents, or please bless my husband. They can do that. So the father can say, God bless you. The father can say, may God bless you. Now, in English, we say, God bless you. It's really, it can be also in a subjunctive sense, in the sense that it's a may. Um, but usually if they do it, if they distinguish that, it's actually better. But um, you can take the holy oil and use that. I, there was one case um, where an exorcist was called to someone's house because the kids were just running around a muck for no reason whatsoever. The priest just broke out the holy oil, put it on the kids' foreheads, and boom, immediately they just stopped and mellowed out. So sometimes you'll see that. I'm not saying every time your kid gets to be obnoxious that somehow or another it's because he's possessed. But I am saying that um, if you do that regularly, it will help provide a certain level of protection. You can also use it on yourself, just making it a sign of the forehead, um, sign of crossing the forehead. Um, you can place the oil in the area that is influenced by the demon, even in your, even in um, bodily, or um, as I said, making a sign of the cross. You can also put it on things uh, by making the sign of the cross uh, over the thing that is discovered to be influenced. This includes animals, although normally it's better to use holy oil on, uh, on animals unless you put it on their forehead or their head or something. But even then, you have to be careful because the next thing they want to do is they want to get it off and that type of thing. So it's better you to use uh, holy water with animals. Um, uh, you can put it in houses. You make signs of the cross made over um, the front entrances to the doors and windows or on items in the house which are affected. When exercising a house, be sure to make a sufficient increase to your neighbor. <laughs> One time, this one woman came to me. She says, "My house is possessed. Things are moving around the house. And everyone's a gap. Things are moving around the house." And um, so I said to her, um, the, "The diocese had sent two exorcists there. They both looked at the uh, two priests. They looked at it and they said, uh, yeah, the house is possessed. They left without doing anything. Like, oh, there's something wrong.' Here. So I said, "What are your neighbors like?' And she had a witch coven living next door. And so I said, "Well, there's your problem." Um, so the uh, but the oil oils very often, if, and too, if the priest exercises the 
the location and then blesses it and things like that very often in which cup they'll disband because they can't perform it. They'll try and usually they'll try and do something to break that blessing. And sometimes it does get broken. Um, and then you end up with even a worse situation than you had before. But you know, this is spiritual warfare. This is this is actually part of it. But using the holy oil can actually keep those kinds of things at bay from affecting the house. Where I often tell people ask what your neighbors are like. Um, and what the kind of neighborhood is, and what the behavior of was the people who lived there before you. It's a good idea to kind of get a sense of, you know, who lived in the house, you know, um, that type of thing, to get a sense of what was in there so that you end up with bigger problems. Because I have had people who um, bought a house and couldn't find out there was a witch who lived in there and she performed witchcraft, and the people gave influence as a result. And so I tell people, stay, uh, not, not every house is that way, you know, not everybody's in witchcraft, but you just want to make sure you're not getting a handful. So, um, also make sure you use it on each person in the house when you exercise the house if you're a priest. Um, and it's a good idea to have it present during exorcism unless there's um, some cause for there's some cause for spiritual concern about it. All of this should tell you that demons love place. They love places just as much as we do. Why? Well, it's kind of like this. You know, when people get married, wherever the guy proposed to her, the woman very often has an affection for that place in her heart, because that's where a good thing happened, right? And God's the same way. We bless places, and so um, it's a good place. Well, demons are the opposite. When very simple things happen to you, they say like it because they get a certain power out of the place, very often they have control over it, and things like that, and so they, they like places quite a bit. Uh, and this is based upon the fact that sinner that people committed in the place. This is why, okay, they like places and they like things, because they like taking possession of things. This is one of the reasons why when I read the New Book of Blessings, I was just absolutely floored. I wasn't scandalized, because I'm pretty much beyond that, but I was floored that they said, you don't bless the things, you bless the people. That is just absolute insanity, and whoever put that out should be flogged. Because the fact of the matter is that what they were doing is allowing demons to gain greater access to people in their lives. It was just spiritually short-sighted. If you discover that something demonic or, uh, or by witchcraft is done in the house or some other place, it should be exercised. And also make sure it's, um, uh, it's, make sure it's permissible to offer mass there, but very often saying mass in a place that's been possessed will help significantly to break the possession. Uh, holy oils can be used, you can be consumed. So I usually tell people you don't get lots of it, you can consume it. You don't fry your bacon in it, <laughs> because you're going to end up dumping it down the, you know, the, the drain or whatever. But uh, the point is it should all be consumed, but you can use it in salads and things of that sort. Um, you can use it in cooking. Um, it's, you know, and again, unless the cooking is the type of thing that is going to be dumped out or it's not going to be consumed in the process. And this is a really good thing because if you consume holy oil and um, blessed salt, or exercise salt and the oils, it provides you a certain amount of protection. And if you're being influenced, it'll also start driving these kinds of things out. Very often, people are possessed, they'll, um, you know, receive the Eucharist and then every half an hour you give them holy water. And it's pretty brutal. If you don't have holy water, you got to feed them oil, and that's that's usually not very pleasant, but it really has an effect on them, especially depending on the kind of location in which the possession is occurring, like if it's in the stomach or something of that sort. Um, I also tell people, if you have teenagers, feed it to them regularly. Uh, not because they don't like teenagers, but just because of the fact that they need the extra graces to get through a period that is very often difficult in our lives. Okay. The next is the use of votive candles that are blessed in the old rites with the old rites, holy water, um, which I'll talk about the whole holy water, why that's why you want to do it in the old rite. Um, but if you bless them, it, it's actually the blessing is to drive out demons of the air. Now, what happened was, is just as there were angels that were assigned the task of taking care of the weather and things of that sort, when the demons who were part of that rank fell, at least this is my understanding, when they fell, they took some of them took possession of the air. Now some of them say that they actually took possession of the air because they, they vacillated and so they weren't cast all the way down into hell. That's just not that's just bad theology. And it's not based upon um, sound reasoning. But what happened is, is there were certain that they, they took possession there. Now, what this means is whenever we say, whenever we do something, um, whenever we curse or we do something like that, we use bad speech, what will happen is the, um, what will very often happen is, is that the demons will take possession of that particular error. It can have a cumulative effect 
Well, how do we know this? There's an actual ritual. It's in the, it's in the ritual of Toledo. It's, uh, it's in a book I give it to, which I give to priests. And um, in it, there is an, uh, an exorcism of storms and tempests. And I'll give you an example. One time, um, a deacon, because the deacons can do certain things. Um, I mean, so can priests. This guy is now a priest in the fraternity. He, <clears throat> there was just this really bad hailstorm that was just pounding them. So he started that, and when he finished the last line, it just stopped. What this means is, is that it can have a cumulative effect. Have you ever heard of global warming? But don't get me wrong, I don't think there is global warming. I do think that, there, that, there, that the, the behavior of the weather patterns is getting strange, but our lady already predicted that at La Salette, <coughs> um, that the weather patterns would change. And the reason, one of the reasons they're changing is because there's more and more demonic influence over nature because man's being sinful with respect to nature. And so he's ceding control over these things to the demonic. Um, it could also have, it could also be based somewhat in the science, but the science obviously is, the jury is out. I mean, even though the popular people are all heading in one direction, a lot of the scientists, the scientists that are really serious about it said, well, we don't really know. And um, I always get a charge out of reading those things about how people who are big into global warming are attending a conference where it's snowing in <laughs> But anyway. Um, anyway, the votive candles, because they're exercised, they'll actually drive genes out of the air. This is one of the reasons that have to be shut the votive candle burning all the time in your house, because it'll actually help to, um, to drive them out. Um, this is also true about incense and the asperges at mass, but it's also true about incense. The incense is blessed. Um, actually, there's kind of a story. You know, there's a funny story about, um, I believe it was Pius IX, that he had an audience with some Protestants, and at the end of it, they said, you know, please bless us, please bless us, and he didn't want to do it, and they just kept insisting, and they said, okay, I'll put a little cards and cards in order for Marmarys, which is the Latin phrase in which you do to bless incense, and it, the translation is, may you be blessed in whose honor you shall be burnt. But anyway, um, uh, the point being is that the actual exercise, the epiphany, if you can get some, if you could, I usually um, exercise, I bless and exercise hordes of the incense at the epiphany because it has an exorcism attached to it. That's very effective for people to burn in the houses and when you're doing exorcisms to drive things out. So incense is good. You can have, the priest can just bless it outright. There is a blessing in this, the, this book I give to priests that actually has it in there. Um, Okay. Um, it's unfortunate they drop the asparagus at mass because the asparagus would actually drive demons out of people. And it also blesses people, but it would actually drive them out so they could actually concentrate in, uh, at mass. So it's unfortunate that that's been dropped for the most part. I believe you can still do it in your but they, they drop it. Okay. Why don't we stop there? And if anybody has any questions, because there's a number of other things I want to talk about that you can do, but I want to kind of stop there and give us some time for questions. Yes. Uh, children, young children that are sociopaths, have you had any dealings with that? Mm -hmm. I got one right now. It's about a year and a half old, and that thing is just unbelievable. I mean, it it does and says things that a kid seven, eight, nine, ten years of age would think and do. So, um, which is obviously, but kids, even younger kids, kids like um, 7 to 10, yeah, they can become sociopaths at that stage, and that's usually a sign of possession. In most sociopaths, um, it's possession in most cases, or, or an extreme form of obsession. Yes? Um, do curses have to be reversed by the person who said them? No. They don't have to. It's less, they, it will have a profound effect if they do. But um, it can be broken just by the person who has received the curse and the priest assisting. So, so you would have to have a priest? Not only. Sometimes people just do it on their own, but um, it depends on the degree of how much they're influenced. Yes? How can you know if there's a wind in your area? Strange things moving around in your house very often? No. That's one of the ways. But one of the other reasons, one of the other ways is you should just buy will have stickers like Wiccans or certain things they'll put in their yards, which are dead giveaways like little statues and, you know, or they'll have the, the round ball sitting out in the middle, just around, you know, there's some things like that. So there's sometimes they'll give you a cue. A lot of them are pretty bold, especially after they start having an effect with their witchcraft to kind of bold them, just let you know. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm a witch. Uh, yes. What can you do with somebody who seems to be 
affected by evil spirit, but they won't, they don't know it and won't do anything about it. It depends. If they, if, they, if they don't want you doing anything, they don't want to receive your help, there's absolutely nothing you can do. This is one of the reasons why, if you get a person very often, a good person is possessed. I recently had a case. Um, uh, the person came to me, and it was a clear case of possession. We even discovered where the possession was within her. And there came a point where she didn't want to give something up. So, because she wouldn't give up, and that ultimately meant then she wasn't going to do what I asked her to do. She wasn't going to really take the help, and so you just say, "Well, then there's nothing I can do for you. I'll pray for you, but that's it." If they, if there's no blockage on their side, you can see the binding prayers and slowly it'll start having its effect. But you better say the, the prayers for you better say some prayers for protection for yourself to make sure you don't end up yourself becoming beat around a little bit. Because they, you know, no good deed will go unpunished is their motto. So. Yes. Father, well, what can you do to uh, pray against fornication or what teenagers are in the back? Illegitimacy? Yeah. Uh, homosexuality teens are in the back? Yeah. And also, um, I forgot the other thing. There was one other thing where I had in my mind to kind of pray against. So, what can I do for kids? Well, the principal thing that you have to okay, let me let me let me tell you the progression. In Latin, there's a phrase in the Old Testament, and the, the phrase is "fornicator obste." That's the, the phrase that you hear in Latin. And "fornicare" uh, actually means to engage in idolatry, but it's also the root word for fornication. And the reason being is, is because. What always happens is the minute right worship to God is not rendered, the first effect is that people start getting involved in things that are against the Sixth Commandment you know, in the wrong way. That's the first effect. In fact, they actually had a phrase in the tradition that um, the churchical abuse leads to self-abuse. For priests, the church will be abusing very often as he really struggles with chastity. Where the other way around, if he's trying to be very reverent, that type of thing, that very often the chastity will come. Right? So, um, and so part of that is because once you do sanctifying grace by doing, um, by worshiping God in an undue manner, then you're kind of left to the wilds. Okay, so then, so one of the first effects of undue worship is the spirit of fornication. And then, of course, the spirit of fornication, we all know this if you're pro life. Well, if you have the spirit of fornication, then you're going to have contraception. If you have contraception, you're going to have abortion. If you have abortion, you're going to have euthanasia. So just go down the road, right? So the moral of the story is, is that, and this is why I tell people, the cause is always greater than the effect. Oh. You know, steam isn't as hot as the flame that produces it. Okay, so that means that undue worship to God is a worse sin than abortion. Now... But that doesn't mean that abortion is an atrocity. It's just abortion tells us just how whacked out we really are in relationship to the first commandment. So the way you get pain straightened out is you've got to get them involved in right order of worship. And that means they have to be taught their catechism, they have to be taught right and wrong, they have to be doing those kinds of things. Now, if they're already involved in it, you're just going to have to do prayer and fasting and do the things to try and get them protected and encourage them to stop it and, and things of that sort. But until that gets straightened out, you know, until, and very often it's, I find that the youth today, I find with the youth today that unless they have some semblance of morality or religion to try and get them to stop, it's virtually impossible. The only time they'll stop, and it's usually women who won't stop, is because they're just sick of the effects of it. You know, they're sick of the, the effects of the fornication, they're sick of the, you know, that type of thing. And so, um, whereas guys are less sensitive to that kind of thing. So, but the point is, is that, uh, that you've got to get them established. And right, this is why you've got to get your teenagers praying. Most people systematically fail in praying with their children. Systematically. And then they wonder why their kids are having a hard time going through people. Well, they, they have to have a prayer. Where's the grace going to come from? You know, going to Mass on Sunday is good. The grace of Sunday grace will come from that. But that's not enough. It's a necessary thing, but it's not enough. Um, getting them to confession regularly and things of that sort are very helpful too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, I was listening to Father Crop and he had a whole series on spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Which pretty good. He talked about in state of grace, if someone, if you come into contact with something that's cursed or if someone puts 
like you know the evil eye or something like that on you that somehow it bounces off of you and goes back and inflicts that individual. Are you truly immune or completely sometimes. protected by being steady grace? Sometimes. But uh, sometimes that's not true. In fact, um, exorcists are very careful. You know, sometimes when people are cursed by means of some type of, like, by voodoo, so there's some, like, a nail or something that's in the individual, sometimes you can actually see the thing moving around in the individual. Um, and it can't be surgically removed. That's not how this thing works. Because then what happens is when they go to surgically remove it, the demons, you know, move it around or cause it to just look like it disappears and things of that sort. So what happens is, though, is that you'll actually, um, you'll actually, uh, when it, it, during the exorcism, the, it'll come out. Well, it comes out, you know. The demons are coughed up, and that's how the possession is broken. You don't touch it, because then you can become affected. You, you, you handle it with some other thing, like a cloth or plastic or something like that, and then you burn it or destroy it. And if it can't be burned or destroyed, you put, put it in a river. Um, you have to be careful with stuff you burn. Don't put the ashes down your plumbing, because then you're going to end up with some serious plumbing problems. Um, not just because ash might plug it up, but because the demons then, if there's any residual aspect of the demons on it, they'll plug that up. So you always put it there in a stream of river so it's big enough, etc. So there's specific ways it has to be handled. Um, Sometimes I, I think I would be, I personally, I never tell people that you're immune from it, ever, regardless of how holy you are, because it's this stuff just, even the best of people can become influenced by handling it. So it's, they, they just have to be careful. It's true that sometimes it will actually affect more of the person who put the hex on the thing than the person who handles it. But on the other hand, don't touch it. Make sure it's handled properly. It's usually what I tell people. Yeah. Like, um, role in deliverance, especially in a lot of Matthew, you know, Jesus says, go there for me, you know, what is the role of the laity in deliverance, really, is the question. And the basic thing is by prayer and fasting. It's really the support. That's what the Exilium Christian Rome was actually started for, so that people would actually provide support to the priests. Because delivering somebody requires, God wants a certain level of merit to be obtained before he'll actually drive them out. And so that can be much more quickly gained if the lay people are praying for the people that are possessed and doing penance for them. That's the principal role. There are some cases where... Um, for instance, if a woman is possessed, um, you never do exorcisms on a woman, at least in the beginning stages, without having other people of, of undisputable character there, because the demons can actually do some things that will, you know, when some man's of extreme virtue, you're going to end up in some trouble. So they, they have to have other people there to, to hold them down and things like that, sort of, sometimes. Um, but because of the fact that um, uh, but normally many people should not be trying to deliver other people on their own because then they just open themselves into a tap because they're not sufficiently protected. That doesn't mean that you can't say binding prayers for other people, but you shouldn't be, you know, putting your hands on them and trying to say prayers to deliver them. It's just you're opening yourself up for some serious trouble. There was a case of some Protestants <clears throat> one time who decided, you know, uh, you know they someone who was in New York, this person was possessed, and this says, oh, well, let's deliver him. So they go up in, in the guy's apartment, and they start saying the prayers. And as they're saying the prayers, the, uh, the demon started, the, the individual who was possessed started beating them, and, he, and the demon beat him within an inch of their life. And as he's beating them, he says, you have no authority over me. This is one of the reasons why I tell people, don't get involved in something that you're not prepared to get involved with. The, 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 the priest has jurisdiction, there's a certain level of protection that's provided to him, and there's even certain things he has to do. If you saw the movie Emily Rose, the mistake that that exorcist made, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this last night, but the mistake the exorcist made was not saying binding prayers to find the demons from harming her or keeping her from eating. And it's a common mistake that exorcists make. Oh, yeah, I did mention it last night, but it's, it's the same thing with this. If you don't have this requisite authority or if you don't know what you're doing, stay out of it because you can really get hurt very quickly and very easily. And um, you can end up with bigger problems than the person you're trying to deliver. So really it should be in, in um, praying for the priests that do it and for, the, for their intentions. I tell people, pray for my intention. Don't pray for the person who's liberated. And there's a reason for that. And that's because sometimes the liberation comes in a particular form. You know, it may be that the liberation will come in the form of, of this person breaking an attachment they have to something. So the priest will be praying, not so much that the, the, the demons are driven out directly, but that the, the attachment's broken so that the possession can be broken. And that's more efficacious than just praying directly for the, the, uh, 
the uh, the actions to take pregnant directly so that the person is liberated. The other thing is too is, is that if you if you offer it up to our lady and then say here you give it to this priest, you know I request that you give it to this priest for his intentions, then you're double protecting in a certain sense. It comes from the priest, or uh, you're protected behind the priest and behind our lady. So uh, whereas if you do do it directly, very often I've had this before. I had. Um, um, people that I've liberated and they thought that they would start praying for the people that I'm trying to liberate and then the next thing you know they're getting beat around again so I tell them don't do that you pray for my intentions and then that's what's the most effective thing and that's usually what I tell people to actually help if you're talking about somebody who can't get access to a priest and that type of thing then usually what I do is tell them you know, hook them up with your own Krishna give them the binding prayers and pray for them um, but be very careful so that and do everything to protect yourself, get confession right, or get communion right, or right, things of that sort, so that you're protected so that nothing happens to you. Um, so but that's that's the particular role of prayer and penance, it's a support role principally. Yes. Can you explain the role that uh, demons can have over music, especially the second and pop music and what it affects and has in that? Well part of it is you know, Satan is actually the uh, the angel of music, you know. That's one of his actual titles, and so um, they some of the some of the um, some of the music when you hear it, you know, it's kind of weird. You listen to some of the music that's out there today, and you're like, that sounds vaguely familiar, and you realize, what is that? Just like the possession case I was listening to, like the way the guy's screaming and carrying on and that type of thing. (laughs) 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 But that actually tells you something. In the list, you'll see it's compiled over here. If if uh, if you can get a copy of it, one of them is listening to rock music. People become big possessed or influenced by listening to rock music. And so, when people are, especially teenagers, when teenagers are actually influenced, usually it's by obsession, I'll tell them, stop listening to all rock and roll and jazz. Not that all jazz is bad, but some of it's disorders. So I'll tell them, don't listen to any of it. And usually, within about two weeks, all of a sudden, they're feeling better, things are a lot going a lot better, and that type of thing. So, um, I do talk about music in my book, too about its effect um, psychologically, the different kinds of music and how they affect different faculties in different ways and that type of thing. And so um, that's something that you can take a look at, too. Yes? Father, do you find that there are a lot of uh, positive ministers and all that come to you recognizing that really only a Catholic priest or religion you know, has the authority to drive out the demons? Well, some demons can be driven out without having the authority of a priest or the authority of the church. Um, and so sometimes Protestants will have some success. But usually my experience is when I kind of watch them like on videos. And think, by the way, the Vatican has forbidden the videotaping of exorcisms, which is why if you look on YouTube, there's not a single Catholic one on there at all, Orthodox or Protestants. Um, the church says that you can audio record them for the sake of studying it, investigating it, because a lot of times students will say things and it takes weeks, sometimes months, to sort out what are they really getting after, or they'll say something in a language you've never heard of, you need to take it to an expert because it may be the key to opening the thing up. But with Protestants, um, very often they do things that are just like, man, you're just, you're opening yourself up. Uh, you know, so, um, and, uh, you know, like they'll converse with them, and they'll talk with them, and you're just like, man, that's just, it's not a good idea. The church has done this for 2,000 years, so it's, it knows the do's and don'ts, it lays it out, don't do this, don't do that. That's one of the reasons why training is so important. Without the training, the um, exorcists are very often get themselves into trouble. It's the training for the stuff is just like obsession cases, you don't need a whole lot of training. I mean, if you have it, that's good. But for possession cases, if you don't have training, you're going to end up in some, some serious trouble uh, very quickly. Because what happens is, and this is something I pray for all the time, is that I don't cause more damage than I saw. Because demons can suggest stuff to you that seems absolutely reasonable, and it just ends up causing serious damage. Well, that's the problem with Protestants. They don't have this requisite theological underpinning, and they don't have the requisite... Um, uh, humility very often, and so they end up with all sorts of problems. But they can liberate some people, but not um, not all. And so um, you would think that they would begin to realize that you know there's some that just can't be driven out. So uh, sometimes too, they tend to think that someone's possessed when they're not. The Catholic Church is a bit more judicious, you know. So there are no legitimate cases of mental illness, and has absolutely nothing to do with possession. Um, and very often they don't see, are not able to see that.